from Two Keto LLC. It's the Obesity Code Podcast with Dr. Jason Fung and Megan Ramos. Each week, we bring you lessons and stories from the Intensive Dietary Management Program in Toronto, Canada. I'm Carl Franklin. This week, it's our Thanksgiving holiday special. The Obesity Code Podcast is brought to you by Two Keto LLC who strives to support the low-carb community with podcasts and other publications. And you can support our mission by making a monthly pledge, no matter how small, at patreon.2keto.com. Today we're talking about strategies for getting through the holidays. Dr. Fung and Megan Ramos share their experience and wisdom, and also what they're thankful for this year. Both American and Canadian Thanksgiving have a lot in common, in that they're both a time for giving thanks for the blessings in our lives. Both take place in autumn. Canadian Thanksgiving falls in October and American Thanksgiving in November. But many cultures have an autumn festival that takes place around harvest time. I counted at least 20 autumn festivals around the world. In agricultural areas, they tend to be times to reflect and give thanks. Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead, is a two-day festival celebrated in Mexico for praying and remembering friends and family who've passed. The Diwali Festival of Lights is an ancient Hindu festival in India, which celebrates the victory of light over darkness. And the list goes on and on. The history of American Thanksgiving is interesting and a little bit sad. Unraveling history from lore can be difficult at best, so... Let me just tell you what everybody agrees is fact. The Pilgrims were a group of mostly English Europeans who in 1690, after fleeing Amsterdam to escape religious persecution, fled Europe altogether for the New World aboard a ship called the Mayflower. They were Puritans, a group of moral fundamentalists inspired by the philosophy of John Calvin. One of the famous First Nations people to help the Pilgrims was a man named Tisquantum, or Squanto. One of the last of the Patuxet tribe, he had actually been to Europe before the pilgrims even landed. Six years before the landing of the Mayflower, Squanto was abducted by Thomas Hunt, an adventurer who kidnapped 20-some-odd other natives and sold them into slavery in Spain. Squanto managed to escape to England somehow, and there became part of an effort to settle Newfoundland, and later on, New England. He had considerable experience with the English by the time he got back to Massachusetts, and is credited with helping the settlers forge their way through harsh conditions, learn to hunt and raise corn, and is also said to have been present at the very first Thanksgiving dinner, a mythical feast that brought settlers and natives together in peace. Little did anyone know what kind of nightmare awaited the First Nations people in the decades to come. We don't actually have Thanksgiving as such in Australia. That's my Two Keto Dudes co-host, Richard Morris. But Julie and I lived in America for eight years, and the first time we experienced Thanksgiving was in when we lived in Florida, and this was in 1999, and we stayed with a Cuban-American family, and we experienced a Cuban-American version of Thanksgiving, which was uh, all you could eat pork. (laughs) Uh, But in Australia, we have a similar event called Boxing Day, which we have on the 26th of December, the day after Christmas Day. And generally what happens is your extended family come over and you have a big feast and then everybody watches uh, sport on TV. Generally in Australia for Boxing Day, it's cricket. Uh, We have a big Boxing Day match. It's a five-day match that starts on Boxing Day and it's at the MCG, the Melbourne Cricket Ground. And whenever the English are out, uh, it's normally uh, the Ashes, which is what's happening this year. So everybody will have a big family feast and then sit down and watch the Ashes and fall asleep in front of the TV in a food coma and then uh, wake up a couple hours later and eat leftovers. So, So it's a similar kind of experience to Thanksgiving in America. Historically, the end-of-year holiday season in the U.S. kicks off on Thanksgiving and goes until the new year. During this time, many people eat a lot, and mostly stuff they know isn't good for them. 
Dr. Fung explains holiday weight gain. So one of the things that we need to understand is that weight gain is not actually steady throughout the year. So in fact, most people gain the majority of their weight uh, over the holiday period, which is defined as American Thanksgiving to New Year's uh, Day. Unless they've suffered a traumatic event or some kind of huge disruption in normal life, most people won't suddenly gain a lot of weight. Most people gain about a pound a year. There are certain periods of time, adolescence, pregnancy, um, midlife in women, and after marriage in men, where people are particularly prone to gaining weight. But most people just gain about a pound a year. It doesn't sound like a lot, but a pound a year uh, over 40 years can be 40 pounds. If it's two pounds a year, it could be 80 pounds. So you can very rapidly uh, gain weight. And studies have shown that clearly people put on most of their weight for the year over the holidays. Now, it doesn't just go on and stay on. People lose and gain weight all year long. But most people gain significant weight over the holidays. Here's Richard Morris again. There was a National Institute of Health study by Jack Yanofsky et al. published in 2000 in the New England Journal of Medicine entitled A Prospective Study of Holiday Weight Gain that investigated the common assertion that the average American gains 5 pounds or 2.3 kilograms over the holiday period between Thanksgiving and New Year's Day. They tested the weight of 200 adults every couple of weeks and they separated their weight changes into three periods. The two months before the holiday, from late September to mid-November, the two months of the holiday from mid-November to mid-January, and the two months after the holiday from January to March. Their mean weight increased significantly during the two months of the holiday season. They increased by 0.37 kilograms, or roughly 0.8 of a pound. But in the two months before the holiday, they only increased 0.18 kilograms, roughly 180 grams or about a third of a pound. And after the holiday, they decreased their weight by 0.07 kilograms, about 70 grams or roughly a sixth of a pound. During the post-holiday period, so immediately in January, is the only period of time where we see the average uh, weight go down. Uh, again, clearly I think it's because people have noticed that they've gained weight over the holidays and they're trying to lose it. Unfortunately, the amount of weight loss is less than 0.1 kilos or uh, far less than a quarter of a pound uh, on average. So not nearly enough to make up for the immediate holiday weight gain or even the pre-holiday weight gain sort of uh, regular weight gain during the year. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there is that attempt and there is a small uh, amount of weight loss on average. So according to this study, the more obese you are, the easier it is for you to gain weight and the harder it is for you to lose weight. Sound familiar? On average, the subjects ha only had a body mass index of 25. So this was a uh, relatively lean uh, population when they looked at people who gained significant weight, that is more than five pounds, uh, there was a clear predilection for people who were obese. So during the holidays, not only is there a lot of eating and drinking and that kind of thing, but there's also a lot of stress. If you look at the stress levels in people, they go way up during the holidays. And this is also an interesting phenomenon because people think that perhaps it's the season and, and so on. If you look at mortality, if you look at the uh, rate of people who die, it's actually much higher in the holiday period. People say, well, maybe it's because the winter, so you're getting pneumonia, you're getting flu, you're out in the cold. But this phenomena also exists in the southern hemisphere, where it's actually warmer during the holiday period. The thought is that it's likely related to a lot of stress that goes on. Uh, suicides tend to go up and so on. There's definitely a contribution of stress to weight gain. We know this from um, 
you know, anecdotal studies, but also when we use synthetic forms of uh, cortisol, such as prednisone, therapeutically, so we can prescribe this as a medication and it's used as a powerful anti-inflammatory for asthma, for example. And we, when we give high doses, people gain weight. So it's clearly one of the hormonal mediators of obesity. And stress, if you're under a lot of personal stress, your cortisol levels are going to go up. And that may cause or uh, make worse the weight gain. So we've gone down this rabbit hole to illustrate the point that most people gain significant weight over the holidays. Now, what do we do about it? First of all, we know that most of the weight gain, not all, but most of the weight gain that happens for the year happens in that period of time between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Therefore, you have to be extra vigilant during that period of time. Dr. Fung says, you know what? That's okay. Go ahead and indulge during the holidays and don't beat yourself up too bad. What we don't try to do is uh, be a Grinch. That is to say, oh, you know, you shouldn't eat anything on Christmas Day. You know, if you have your family around you and you're having a big uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner, uh, that's not the day to be fasting. That's a day to be celebrating. It's not a day for you to kind of uh, miss out on everything. What the good doctor isn't saying is that you should just forget all about your metabolic syndrome during the holidays. Share the spirit, have a good time, but realize that you probably have to make up for it. If you try to take that entire sort of six-week period as a break, it may not be very successful. And the more overweight that you are, the harder it is for you uh, because you're going to gain more weight and then you're going to have more trouble taking it off. So you have to be extra vigilant. So that is, you have to pick your days. This Thanksgiving, I took Dr. Fung's advice to heart. I fasted from Monday to Wednesday night, and Thanksgiving, of course, is on a Thursday. I wanted to give my insulin a little break. Now, I'm still not going to eat carbs, but I am going to indulge. And, you know, I'm not going to gain any weight, but probably won't lose any either. And that's okay. If you're going to let yourself have some carbs over the holidays, Dr. Fung says... Just limit it to one or two days, then get right back on the horse. If you go back to sort of a hundred years ago, people still celebrated Christmas. But they didn't celebrate it for the entire month and a half from the end of November to the 1st of January. It just didn't happen that way. I mean, you got to get back to your regular routine and really cut down the carbohydrates, watch the sugars particularly, and add in those days of intermittent fasting where you can. No, Christmas Eve is not the time to be doing that. But on the other hand, it's an easy way to make some changes. Perhaps, uh, for example, for desserts, for sugar, we know sugar is highly fattening. And this is the period of time where you're really going to get a lot of people who are um, making a lot of Christmas cakes, Christmas cookies, and so on. But the point is that you don't need to be eating that every single day of the six weeks. One of the problems of getting through the holiday period is you spend it with your family and they love you. And humans show love with food. One of the things that new clients often ask me or new patients ask Jason and I in clinic, um, how to get through the holidays and their biggest fear about the holiday is dealing with their family. And that, of course, is Megan Ramos, director of the Intensive Dietary Management Program. Family members just not understanding that they're not eating these carbohydrates. People who are recovered alcoholics and whose friends and family know that they're recovered alcoholics, well, their friends and family do not pressure them to drink. People who are drug addicts, uh, their families do not pressure them to do drugs. But us as carbohydrate addicts um, or people with insulin resistance who are constantly craving carbohydrates, everyone around us almost is pressuring us. 
oh, just have that extra piece of pumpkin pie and just have that extra scoop of ice cream with it. And oh, it's Thanksgiving. And just to have that entire, entire sweet potato casserole, just eat the whole damn thing. I'm a carbohydrate addict. And if I have those roasted potatoes, it's gonna turn into me then having the rest of the basket of bread. Oh, and I might as well have dessert. And I might as well just totally pig out. And this will be my one last day, right? Like every every addict tells himself, this is gonna be my one last. This is gonna be my one last hurrah. Then of course, you're back on the blood sugar roller coaster. You have a sugar crash. You wake up starving, and your body is craving sugar to get your levels up. Let's face it, hypoglycemia is dangerous, and your body knows it. It just goes on and on and on from there, and the only ones to help us are ourselves. We're the only people that can stop us, and our friends and family don't realize that this is, this is a struggle for us, and that peer pressure is really tough. My mother, she would constantly put the her roasted potatoes, oh my gosh, like if I was to have one last meal, our roasted potatoes would still be part of my one last meal. They're fantastic. Um, but she would always put them in front of where she knew I was gonna be sitting at the table. And she would always make sure there was extra bread, extra fresh bread there for me, even though she knew that I was gonna say I didn't want any. No matter how many times I told her I didn't want any, she would still make sure that it was available and this would just drive me through the roof. And I just had to put my foot down one day and just say no and not eat it. So she would have all these extra potatoes, all this extra bread. She'd have this whole dessert that nobody really ate because she just made it special for me. And I know her feelings were hurt the first few times, and that's, that's sad. I don't want to ever hurt my mom's feelings. My mother's an incredible person. But I just needed to because I knew it would never stop. And I'm my only advocate in this life when it comes to my health. And I did the same thing with friends too. You know, one of my girlfriends was bugging me one night at dinner to have a dessert when we were celebrating something special. And I just said, listen, like I'm not gonna have it. I, I don't even like that dessert. Um, so if I'm, I'm going to deviate from my diet, it's certainly not going to be for that, just for the sake of having dessert this evening. And second, I've got serious health issues here. I need to deal with them. Just because my age is young does not mean that I am healthy. And who's going to take me, again, to dialysis when my kidneys fail from diabetes? Are you? I turned to her and I said, are you going to take me? Are you going to leave your family and leave your job? and just it, disrupt your whole life to take me to dialysis three times a week because of this dessert that I don't even really care for. And she thought I was a little bit mean and she thought I was a little bit insane at the time, but she got over it. The point is your friends and family will get over it. And at the start, they're not gonna understand because you are gonna be unwell or you are gonna be overweight. I went through a phase where you know people just thought I was being totally ridiculous and what I was doing was just crazy. And here I was, the overweight girl, eating sticks of butter, pouring oil over everything, eating the turkey skin at the Thanksgiving Day table covered in butter and I was just a sick fat girl doing this at the table and people just thought I was nuts and that was the most difficult period that I went through um, not being perfect and living this lifestyle and the scrutiny of other people who didn't support my lifestyle. But eventually I persevered and I got down to a great weight and I became pretty healthy across the board and I was eating, I just continued to eat all of this stuff. And then people wanted to support me. They saw that eating this way, I achieved this great result. So and even if they think that I'm a medical anomaly or <laughs> just, just a weird being that goes against the norm and can do it, they wanna support me. 
And now when we go over to my mother's for holidays, instead of having a big plate of Rice Krispie squares, which were a former guilty pleasure of mine, and potatoes and fresh bread, we have a big plate of prosciutto and salami and olives and, uh, for us to have and, and really great healthy macadamia nuts and almonds and walnuts and really great fatty foods to feast on and she'll always save the turkey skin at Thanksgiving for us. Um, to have. So they do support you. They do see it. But when you're going through the waves and the motions, that's the, that's the most brutal part. Sometimes it can be hard when your family members can eat certain foods that you know will totally derange you. Another reason why the holiday is such a major problem and another concern that people have about the holidays and, and it being difficult time for them is they see all these people eating all these great foods and they start to feel bad that they're not indulging too. One of the best strategies I used was I wasn't designed to eat these foods in the first place. And I keep telling myself that, you know, these are not the foods that make me well. These are the foods that make me sick. And I had to keep telling myself that over and over and over again. But watching these people, seeing them stuff their face with my favorite potatoes and my favorite fresh bread and my favorite desserts, that was tough. That was a big struggle at first. And then at the start, I initially gave in. And then I would get all bloated. I'd feel sick for several days afterwards. My weight would be all over the place with water retention and gaining body fat. And I would feel terrible for like a week or two after each holiday. And I had about a three or four holiday learning curve. Um, so an Easter flew by, Thanksgiving, Christmas, another Easter. And I realized I can't do this anymore. I've just got to start eating clean. How about strategies for preparing in advance for a holiday feast? One of the best strategies of getting through the holidays is to eat a really good fatty meal before the holiday celebration that you're attending. Eating a big omelet full of vegetables. You can have the big, like, Western omelet full of good cheese, bacon, um, and having an avocado. So we usually have an egg dish before these holiday meals with some bacon and some avocado. Having a nice, big, high fatty ketogenic meal, something that leaves us very satiated. Then that way, when I show up at my mother's for Thanksgiving, that I'm already pretty full. So yes, those potatoes might be attractive and I know those potatoes might be good looking, but they're not as sexy to me if, if I was showing up to her house on an empty stomach. Okay, how about some tips for being at the family feast itself? When you actually sit down at the table, just fill your plate up at first with vegetables and good fatty protein and make sure everything on your plate is covered in fat. Almost every household has olive oil in it. Even if the vegetables are steamed or they're boiled, ask someone for their olive oil. Then, you know, go for the dark meat, ask for a bit of the turkey skin and eat that whole plate of food. If you're still feeling like you'd like a little bit of um, sweet potato casserole or if you'd like a little bit of bread or a little bit of some carb that's offered at that meal, then save it for after that. But eat your plate of your good non-starchy vegetables covered in fat, eat your fatty protein, eat that first. And if you want any carbohydrates, eat them afterwards. Megan has a great story about how one of her patients prepared for a combined Thanksgiving and wedding event. Recently, um, for Canadian Thanksgiving, we had a woman um, whose son was actually getting married on the Saturday. So here in Canada, we celebrate 
with um, Thanksgiving on the second Monday in October. And many families actually celebrate Thanksgiving on the Sunday and then we sort of just relax on the Monday. Well, this particular patient, her son was getting married on the Saturday of Thanksgiving weekend and she, um, she was celebrating with just all of her family that have flew in from all over Canada on Thanksgiving Monday. And she um, had worked so hard to lose so much weight and get in shape by her son's wedding and, and just look fantastic. And she was just really, really petrified of just screwing this all up in one one weekend between feasting at the wedding and feasting on Thanksgiving. So what this woman did um, leading up to her son's wedding is that she spent um, she spent the first uh, half of the week doing some intensive fasts. So she fasted from Sunday night to Wednesday night. And from Wednesday night until the wedding on Saturday, she ate just a lot of fat. She knew that when she ate fat, it didn't bloat her and it made her feel full without feeling bloated. And she did not want to be bloated on her son's wedding. And she said she woke up, she ate breakfast on Saturday morning, had a nice big omelet, had some bacon, had some avocado, and then she did it again at lunchtime because she didn't want to be so tempted by all of the treats um, that were going to be available at the, at the wedding. And then by the time Thanksgiving rolled around and she was hosting all these people from all over the place, um, all this friends and family that she hadn't seen, she did the same thing. She woke up. She ate a big breakfast. She didn't graze the entire time that she was cooking for nearly three dozen people. And she said by the time she was done cooking, she said most of the time, she just usually would not want to participate in the meal because she had spent the entire time she was cooking, tasting a little bit here, tasting a little bit there, and she just didn't really want to partake in the, in the meal. But she said this time she actually enjo enjoyed it because she wasn't grazing throughout the day. She would have to taste a little bit here and there just to make sure that it was okay. Um, but she could actually sit down and eat. Like she was then she wasn't stuffed from eating for 12 hours leading up to the time that they sat down for dinner. By this point, she had really eaten so much fat that even though she did make some carbs for these relatives and people brought some carbohydrates, things that she particularly enjoyed for Thanksgiving, she was okay. She had found something, it was working for her. She was enjoying the food that she was eating, the variety in her diet. The fasting was quite effortless for her. It was working. She was able to talk herself out of all these delicious carbohydrates that were present on Monday. And on Tuesday, when she weighed herself, she weighed no more than she did at her last weigh-in, which was the Thursday before her son's wedding and Thanksgiving. Well, I'd like to kick off the Thanksgiving by giving thanks to Tim Noakes, who was responsible for me eventually going low carb. Uh, and it was one of my great privileges this year to have the opportunity to tell him this on our podcast, Two Keto Dudes. And uh, I asked him then how he discovered the low carb approach. Well, Richard, it began on the 12th of December, <laughs> 2010. So that was the day that I finished off a book called Waterlogged and sent it off to my publishers. And it was a 30-year odyssey proving that you could drink too much during exercise and problems could develop. And anyway, uh, when I'd finished, I hadn't been running enough in the last month or two or perhaps even longer. And I went to bed that night and my brain woke me up and said, you've got to get up tomorrow morning and run at six o'clock and you must run every day for the rest of your life. So of course, I listened to my instructions and I went out, I had a dreadful run, I came home and I opened my emails and there was an advert for a book called The New Atkins for the New You, written by three, three guys, Westman, Foley, Volick and Finney. And I said, what a disgrace. These guys have sold out to Atkins. And I said, it's unbelievable. I really trusted them as good scientists and now they've sold out. And then my brain said to me, now, hold on, what happens if they're right? <laughs> so I said, oops, I better find <laughs> So I went straight down to the bookshop. I bought the book. 
And within two hours, I realized that for 33 years, I'd got it wrong and I'd been given the wrong advice. So I decided to experiment on myself. I had an incredibly good result. Then I discovered that I had type 2 diabetes because of my family history. My dad died of the disease. And then I realized that, you know, I was going to go the same way unless I did something. And so I embraced the low-carb diet and benefited enormously from it. I am personally thankful to Nina Teicholz for writing her book, The Big Fat Surprise. That book really gave me the courage and the confidence to confront the finger waggers, friends, family, doctors, especially doctors. Turns out there's more to the story than just don't eat fat. Well, my book really, the main thesis of my book was on saturated fats. You know, there's many ways in which my book overlaps with Gary's, Gary Taubes' book, but the central theme of my book is that saturated fats were unfairly maligned and um, really did not deserve to be demonized and don't cause heart disease. This is just an aside, but I didn't even know that was the central theme of my book until my editor got it, you know, whatever, like however many hundreds of thousands of words. She's like, your book is really about, because I was going to, I was like, my book is a tour through different kinds of fats, you know, because I have a chapter on olive oil. And yeah, I mean, I was going to write a book on trans fats, which was just sort of the history of how we got it wrong on trans fats and wasn't even meant to be particularly controversial. And then I stumbled into this, this idea that my book would be about saturated fats but I think and I think that my book is recognized as the book that has really pierced the debate on saturated fats it was the basis for that time magazine cover with the curl of butter that was based on my book and then New York Times Jane Brody wrote a column on it and I think that it's it is the book that's on saturated fats but um which I guess sounds boastful now that I feel like I'm starting to be vindicated. (laughs) Without Nina's book, we'd still be stuck trying to limit saturated fat in our diets because we thought they caused heart disease. Saturated fats have been more tested than any other nutrient in the diet in the last 50 years. Huge, randomized controlled clinical trials costing hundreds of millions of dollars, and none of those trials, on tens of thousands of people, none of those trials could show that saturated fats has any effect on cardiovascular mortality, any effect on total mortality, and it doesn't seem to have any effect on heart disease as measured by anything that is, you know, that we consider to be reliable. So no, saturated fats do not cause heart disease. I'm also grateful for people like Gary Fetke. He's the Australian orthopaedic surgeon who has been speaking up about the need to cut back on sugar in our diet to reduce diabetes. And he has this great analogy using a cooking technique called the Maillard reaction. The Maillard reaction, I think, is the best way of explaining the complications of diabetes. So the Maillard reaction is something which many people have observed, and it's just a cooking term, effectively. And it's essentially when food goes brown when you heat it up. And the best example I can give is a piece of toast. You put it in the toaster, you heat it up, and the glucose, the sugar in it, combines with the protein and goes brown. It dries out, goes brown. It's toasting. In diabetes, when your blood glucose is out of control and it goes too high, then about two-thirds of it goes into the tissue, and what the tissue can't handle combines with protein under a bit of heat. It's the Maillard reaction. So every time your blood glucose goes up, you are toasting your brain, you are toasting your eyes, you're toasting your kidneys, you're toasting your toes. Welcome to diabetes. So the moment you understand that, that is the day you must decide to go low carb with diabetes. I just don't understand why every endocrinologist and diabetes nurse educated doesn't explain that to people with diabetes. I'm grateful for Gary Taubes explaining in his book Good Calories, Bad Calories how insulin makes our fat cells store energy and how the kinds of foods that we eat determines that. This is pretty simple. You just this is basic endocrinology. So endocrinology is a science of 
hormones and hormone-related diseases. This was worked out in the 1960s. It's true then. It's true today. Um, so our fat cells are very well regulated. They don't just take up calories because we eat too much. They don't even know how much you're eating or how much you're exercising. They don't see. The fat cell doesn't see that. But the fat cell has enzymes on its surface, these chemical molecules on its surface that want to take up fat from the bloodstream and store it, hold on to it. It has enzymes inside the fat cell that will break down fat so that it can get out of the cell and be used for energy. And so when you uh, eat a carb-rich meal, you secrete this hormone insulin, which basically controls this process. So the insulin signals the enzymes on the cell surface to what are called upregulate. Suddenly you have more of these enzymes and they can pull more fat into the fat tissue, into the fat cells. And it tells these uh, enzymes inside the fat cells that break down fat to, to shut down. So when insulin's elevated, your fat cells are accumulating fat. That's what they do. And then as insulin slowly comes down, the reverse happens. And now the fat cells can mobilize fat. So this hormone, this enzyme on the cell surface shuts down and this enzymes inside the cell that break down fat turn on. And now you're mobilized, you're breaking down the fat you store and you're mobilizing. And it's all pretty much regulated by insulin. Other hormones uh, work to get fat out of the fat cells. Uh, insulin is the only, the primary fundamental, at times the only hormone that works to get it in and to keep it there. And so insulin literally makes fat cells fat. And we are the, you know, the integral, the compendium of all our fat, fat cells. That's it. So if our fat cells are getting fat, we're getting fat. And all the fat cell knows is that insulin is telling it to get fat, and the insulin's being secreted by the carbohydrates. So the carbohydrates, it's not that carbohydrates are necessarily converted to fat, although they are to some extent when we consume a lot of sugar, but the carbohydrates are telling insulin to go up, and the insulin is telling the fat cells to hold on to fat. And the longer the, your greater the portion of the day your body is, uh, has elevated levels of insulin, the more fat you're going to store from day to day, the fatter you're going to be. I'm also very thankful to Jason Fung and the opportunity he's given us to produce this podcast, but also, of course, for being our fasting mentor. Thank you, Jason. So what am I thankful for this year? Well, this has been a pretty good couple of years uh, for me personally. Um, and I have so much to be thankful for. So last year, uh, in 2016, I released The Obesity Code and also The Complete Guide to Fasting. And both have done uh, quite well and I've been able to reach a lot of people. And really, it's not about me personally. Uh, but, you know, it's not about making money because selling books is actually a very, <laughs> a very difficult business to be in. Most people think that, oh, you're making millions of dollars, but the royalties are pitiful. I mean, uh, the, the truth is that the um, most of it goes to the publisher and most books lose quite a bit of money when you consider the amount of time that goes into making a book. But really, the rewards of writing are not are not financial. Uh, the rewards are being able to reach a larger audience and I see these emails and uh, Facebook messages and so on where people uh, write in and they say things like, wow, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for writing the book. I was able to take myself off of my medications or my diabetes reversed. And it's, it's an amazing feeling to uh, be able to touch people in such a powerful way um, and not even uh, have known them. So I've been able to affect their lives for the better and I, I, I didn't even know these people. People who have reversed their diabetes, who have been able to lose weight, who feel better about themselves, who regain that self-esteem. And it's, it's not just them who feel good. And that's what people have to understand. It, it's why I write. 
It's why I started the blog uh, in, in 2013. It's all covered at my own expense, at my own time. But the point is, uh, it's it's altruism in the fact, you know, in the way that I am able to uh, help people, and in return, I feel good about myself. So I'm thankful that I've had the opportunity to do that, and my publishers uh, were obviously instrumental to to helping me with that. Um, in addition, this year, of course, we were able to launch this podcast, this uh, great podcast with uh, Carl and Richard and Megan and all of our uh, group of experts that we're trying to bring on on a regular basis. And once again, I'm really, really thankful that I was able to make um, the friendships I've been able to make with Carl and Richard and of course I've been working very closely with Megan for a number of years um, and all these great people we have on this panel so there's two things one I'm really thankful that all of our experts agreed to do this and two I'm grateful for the opportunity that we're able to again present information to the public in a sort of unique sort of um, method and that's really due to the, the, the great efforts of the two keto dudes who put in uh, a lot of time and really most of the time in uh, producing this show so that we can deliver something which is usable, which is listener friendly, which is something that people will be able to um, uh, take to heart and listen to and, and, and improve their health uh, by learning the lessons that, that we, um, we provide. So that I'm very, very grateful for. I think it's a great opportunity. And, um, you know, once again, it's the same uh, idea that when we are able to reach people, people get better, uh, they, they feel better about themselves. But when they write to me, I feel great and this is a win-win situation so absolutely this is a uh, you know something i'm really really thankful for this podcast the ability to speak and so on on a personal front i have uh you know i'm very grateful that my um, children and my wife are in good health and um, my parents and my in-laws as well my dad's in his 80s now and still uh, you know enjoying himself he does have aches and pains here and there but on the whole he's doing very well and my mom also is doing very well um, my kids are healthy one is 14 and one is 11 now they're both in uh, school and enjoying themselves they uh, one plays hockey and one plays basketball and uh, I'm grateful that they've been able to find uh, their kind of um, passion and also uh, good friends and learning how to to be good teammates so all of these things I'm um, thankful for um, I'm thankful to be able to work with Megan Ramos in our IDM program so once again when we set this up we didn't know that this was gonna be a real business um, we thought well we were, had been doing this in our clinic uh, in Toronto, but we had gotten so many emails from people that are like, well, please, can you help me? And they live in different parts of the world. So we thought, well, given this day and age, given the status of our technology, there's actually no reason that we can't touch people and help them throughout the world. And Megan's put in a tremendous amount of energy into building this program and working with these people. And as you can see, some of them, uh, their, their lives have been completely transformed. And um, I remember uh, Megan was saying that at one point she was so busy, but she kept doing it because really being able to help people just felt so good. Uh, because people have been struggling for so long and that's why really we do what we do and we're trying to kind of uh, bring the lessons uh, to life in this podcast and really this has uh, been such a great um, opportunity for us it's been a great uh, educational experience and uh, being out there in the so kind of social media space which is not something that I ever thought I would be doing I'm really uh, grateful and thankful for so uh, I have really a lot of things to be thankful for um, and and you know I hope that everybody has a great uh, Thanksgiving thanks Jason yes we're all thankful for Megan so what am I most thankful for this year? Well, we've had a heck of a year here. 
I know that my husband is American and um, I am a Canadian and we met while he was living in the US and there we um, got married and we had to wait about a year after we got married for him to be eligible to live in Canada. So my husband actually landed as a as a permanent resident of Canada on December 10th of um, 2016. So I am just really thankful that uh, I have been able to live with my husband for this past year. Um, I'm really thankful that we're spending this Thanksgiving in our home in Toronto with our family here, not something that we've been able to, to do before, and that's really special. I'm really thankful too that my family is excited to celebrate and and celebrate Thanksgiving again with Angel and invite his US customs into our Canadian home. Another thing I'm really thankful for is um, the overwhelming amount of support that we've been getting from people all over the world about the intensive dietary management program, about intermittent fasting, about all of the work that Jason and I and our team have been doing over the last few years. Um, it was only five years ago uh, <laughs> that Jason and I started the intensive dietary management program uh, and not it's been about six years since I started my own journey um, with this and even I, I thought and I was just telling this to Jason the other day I thought for sure we were going to be shut down within six months um, and that we weren't going to get any support um, but I, I wanted to see what we could do with it see how many people we could prove wrong and and uh, we had some great patients that we initially started working with in office and they did so fantastic. Um, and we turned a lot of naysayers out there into believers. And I can't, I, um, I can remember the day Jason said that, you know, we were going to do the obesity code book um, and that someone was going to publish something that we were writing or, and that we were doing and it was just so mind-blowing to me and I thought okay well, we'll, we'll sell this book to our patients and an uh, odd number of followers online and then the complete guide to fasting came out. Um, we were able to expand our program from in office to online and now being able to do an online program we're able to help some uh, help people from all over the world not just Ontario residents who live close to our clinic um, but we are able to help people all over the world <music> I am extremely thankful for our health care here in Canada. We have a great public health care system. It's extremely flawed, but compared to the rest of the world, it's pretty fantastic, and I'm exceptionally fortunate. And it's um, so heartbreaking to hear about people that don't have all of the privileges that we do when it comes to having access to great health care and affordable medication. So being able to expand this program online and help people from all over the world who do not have access to resources like we do here in Canada, um, that I'm extremely thankful for. And as a result of that, being able to put our program online and turn our intensive dietary management program into an online program, we've had to build a great team and I'm so thankful to work um, with my wonderful colleagues. Uh, last year we brought on uh, Nadia Patiguana. Um, we brought on my husband Angel Ramos. Um, he's now the director of our, our male metabolic program. Um, and we brought on a, a good friend and a longtime colleague of mine, Rachel Primo. Um, so I get to work with some of my, my best friends and my most loved friends um, on a day-to-day -day basis educating them, helping them help people all over the world um, reach their goals and learn better eating habits and eating strategies. And that's really rewarding. And another thing that I'm really thankful for is now I'm going to be working with another one of my really good friends, Brenda Zorn. Uh, so Brenda Zorn has been a longtime friend of Jason Fong and myself. And 
and she's been a long time um, a follower of the IDM program and uh, we're super happy to have Brenda on board. So that's something I'm very much looking forward to um, for 2018 is continuing to expand the intensive dietary management program online so we can reach um, more and more people throughout the world and work with such amazing people like our team and new people like Brenda bringing them in and getting them even more trained than they already are to help keep uh, everybody our listeners out there and uh, even people who don't even have access to listen to this podcast um, but getting the materials out there online um, and communicating with them through our online program. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really thankful for our, our awesome team. Well, that's our Thanksgiving special. We hope you all have a safe holiday season and meet your health goals. Richard and I would like to add a personal thank you to a group of people without whom we could not have made these podcasts our Patreons. You've been listening to the Obesity Code podcast, lessons and stories from the Intensive Dietary Management Program. The Obesity Code podcast is brought to you by 2Keto LLC, who strives to support the low-carb community with podcasts and other publications. And you can support our mission by making a monthly pledge, no matter how small, at patreon.2keto.com. I'm Carl Franklin. We'll see you next time. Thank you.